And now we're looking at the world sort of post COVID-19. How is it going to look? This is less a hard invest here or there. This is a lot more uh, soft to it. Uh, but obviously the investment themes and trends will come through to a degree. And I'm assuming a post COVID-19 environment. I'm not saying what that is is it a cure is it a, a, a you know a, a antibodies i don't know a vaccine um and I, I don't know when it is you know it's certainly not any time in the next couple of days weeks it's not this year but it's certainly I'm, I'm trying to look out where do we see things happening what do they look like post it <clears throat> and, and the first thing put in this presentation together that absolutely struck me was imagine a COVID 19 pandemic and resulting lockdown without the internet I mean, we must pause a moment and just remember you know, how fortunate we are that as society this happens in 2020 when we have internet, when you know, we can all be sitting 100 plus of you on, 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 on the, the webcast. Uh, we don't need to be at a venue. Uh, if this had happened 20 years ago, it would have been tough. If it happened 40 years ago, it would have, been, uh, it would have just been infinitely harsher. I'm not saying this hasn't been tough. I'm saying thank goodness for the internet. <clears throat> the change in of itself is usually incremental. Um, it, it doesn't happen suddenly. It's, it's incremental, uh, it's hard, it, it's typically resisted. Uh, people find change uncomfortable. We like the status quo, uh, even if the status quo is not always necessarily great. We worried about what the, you know, what's the other side. And you know, the grass is green on the other side, but we still tend to stay on our side of the fence. So change in of itself usually happens very slowly um, and, and lots of resistance to it because of that uncomfortableness to it. And an example here from Eric uh, Brian Joseph from MIT. I practiced that name and then I completely messed it when I did it. We'll call him Eric. Uh, the productivity J curve. Companies are slow to adapt new technologies and when they do, productivity actually dips at first. And the example he gives is electricity. It took over 30 years for electricity to make its way in a meaningful manner into factories and homes. Um, <clears throat> And that's typically how change is. And he is obviously talking about companies, um, but it, I think it applies to a much broader sort of societal process as well. We are, you know, and if you think about, uh, you know, the first iPhone came out, what, 13 years ago. And at that point, people had phones, they were Blackberries and the like. We go back 20 years, people didn't. And then it just sort of suddenly j -curves. Suddenly everyone's got a, got a, got a smartphone, the, the candy bar phones. You know, back in 2007 when the iPhone came out, most people still had a candy bar phone. You know, a couple of Blackberries floating around, a few sort of quasi smart, smart devices. But it really was those candy bar phones, which, you know, played Snake, uh, sent SMS, uh, and, uh, made phone calls, you know, that, that, that was the point of them. Um, it slowly gathers and then it just absolutely takes off and, and, and technology is the same. The difference here, like what COVID-19 did, what the pandemic has done, is it forced change on us regardless. It forced us to live those changes and those changes form habits. You know, it, it wasn't a case of, you know, where are we now? We are uh, uh, first of June, sorry, July. Um, it was four months ago, less than four months ago when South Africa had its first case. Go back four months, early, early, early March. The only country region in lockdown was Wuhan, China. Uh, Italy was about to go into lockdown. France a little bit later. We did it uh, towards the end of March, 27 March. But even that process, you know, President Ramaphosa spoke on a Sunday evening. Basically, closed our borders and and you know it, it did a little bit. Uh, literally, following Monday, eight days later, announced that that Thursday midnight we were going into a hard lockdown and it happened suddenly and and that makes the change different to what we're talking about in this productivity j curve in that this wasn't something we could opt out of we are in it and when i say we you know more than half of this planet has has been in some or other form of lockdown some of it fairly hard uh, south africa very hard lockdown wuhan italy uh, france parts of europe very hard some of it parts of the us uh, uh, northern africa the rest of us parts of uh, south america less hard but certainly we've had the change forced on us and it is still coming it is still coming thick and fast the way we interact the way we shop the way we go to work uh the way we move around our inability to move around you know it, june this is the first june in in memory for me that i i didn't go to durban where it's nice and warm and and, and you know get some 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 what they call winter in Durban, the rest of us call pleasant, sunny, warm days. So the fact that it's been forced on us is marked and, and, and matters, and I'm gonna come back to it a fair bit. 
but also expect pushback. And we've seen pushback in the lockdown right since the beginning. Um, you know, during during April, it was, oh, what about the economy and, and all of that? And there's always going to be that pushback. There's always going to be resistance to change even if ultimately the change is proved to be correct and right. And, you know, how do we prove something correct and right? There's a debate on its own. Um, but certainly the, the, the expectation is, is that there will be pushback. And we have seen some of that pushback already. We've seen it in the U.S. with the insistence of opening, uh, the refusal to wear masks and the like. Uh, we, we've seen it in South Africa um, with, with, with uh, uh, businesses pushing back. You, know, you can now go to casinos, restaurants and the like, limitations. But sort of things that were only expected to happen in level one suddenly happening in level three point something or other which we find ourselves in early july so what are some of those long-term changes going to be i'm going to run through them i'll touch on the details and then we'll come back to them at the end and wrap up what i think are going to be the three key components that are going to be fundamentally different uh, going forward obviously work from home or, or as uh, Mr. Naya from Sassfin uh, said on my show last week, live at work. And that's an important distinction. This is the biggest impact arriving out of COVID-19. And we've got to be very careful with that work from home or live at work. You know, we've got to make sure that it's still a home environment with workspace. And I'll touch on that. But, you know, 50% of Americans worked from home in, in April and May. Uh, that is that is unprecedented. I mean, that is just a, 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 a crazy number. Now, you know, a, a large slice of Americans also lost their jobs in April and May, uh, and then a whole bunch continued on working. But the point is, most businesses never liked the idea of work from home. And I, I work with a bunch of corporates, and I'm not going to name names, but big corporates, corporates of you know thousands, tens of thousands of staff. And the work from home was always like, no, like you can wear civvies on Friday or, or something like that. There was, it wasn't even something which was being seriously entertained by, by top management. They just weren't interested. Then, of course, 27 March came. Uh, work from home had to happen. If you wanted your business to carry on going, you either worked from home or you shut it down. And now I speak to those same top senior executives, man, and they quite like this work from home. They like it from a personal perspective, but actually you know, their business continues being uh, pr uh, productive. They're still trading, they're still making profits. And the mind shift in just a couple of months has been phenomenal. Whereas back in December, no chance was it gonna happen. Six months later, it's like, okay, let's look at this whole pandemic thing when it's over. Let's look at how we can work from home. Let's look at how we can perhaps have staff. And there's major implications um, around how this will work. You know, what do our houses look like? What do our cities look like? Transportation, costs, office blocks. You know, those corporates and their giant head offices dotted around our country. Uh, suddenly, I don't need all that space, perhaps. Maybe if people are working from home. Uh, productivity can be there, and there are exceptions. Quick point, the Shopify CEO, on record, he, 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 he put his entire team home and uh, we sent them home and he sent everyone home. And his key point is, he says, the problem is you got to be very careful of a blended environment where some people work at home and some at the office. And either if it's a permanent split or sort of rotational split, he says, you either got to be 100% remote or 100% in the office. And his logic is quite simple, that if you've got a blended approach, the people who are at home working, do suffer. They they miss out the walk, the water cooler talk, so to speak. You know, you, you go into a meeting and before it starts, there's a little bit of chit chat, and sometimes there's a brainwave that comes out of that. You, you bump into someone in the car park or the cafeteria or the 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 the, the, the escalators or something, and suddenly the, a thought comes. Um, and and therefore the remote work is if there's a if there's a work of the office uh, team as well as a remote team, and if it's a sort of a merged team but split geographically that becomes a significant challenge. And so Shopify is saying that's a, we're just, you know, we're, we're going home and we're not coming back. Uh, Google was talking around coming back in July, they're now saying September. Uh, Facebook is, is saying, you know, later this year. Twitter's saying, you know what, if you don't wanna come back, that's fine. At this point, no staff are returning. And we're gonna see that evolution. We're gonna see that change uh, as it happens. And I think we're gonna get the blend. I think there will be a few companies brave enough, Shopify, one of them, to say it's 100% work from home. I think most companies are going to do that blend. And if you're part of the remote, you've got to be cognizant of the fact that you are missing out on some of the, of, of the process and the environment and opportunity, brainstorming, et cetera, et cetera. And you've got to make, make design plans to, to make that work. And of course, it's hard for some members of staff and some businesses. 
you know, women with kids at home, low skilled. I mean, if you're low skilled, it's 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 nigh impossible. Uh, manufacturing. I mean, there's lots of spaces where the work from home doesn't work. Uh, there's lots there it does. You know, in tech, it absolutely does. A lot of financial services, it absolutely does. Um, a lot of it doesn't. Manufacturing, construction, etc. And some home environments just aren't conducive to it. And it's why we're trying to get schools open uh, around the world, I imagine, is because, you know, unless the schools are open, people can't go back to work. And it, 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 it messes with productivity um, if you're trying to be a work from home and manage kids and teach them and be a homeschool teacher all at the same time. You know, essentially do, trying to do three or four jobs and truthfully, all of them suffer in the process. One of the key things is, is out of office face-to-face -face meetings are just dead. I got invited to a meeting in Santon. And I'm like, I'm never going to a meeting in Santon ever again in my life. To what purpose? You know, a 30 or 40 minute meeting can take two hours of my life with, you know, making sure you arrive on time, uh, parking, traffic, getting out, finding your car, paying, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's just, it's like, no, there's Zoom. Now, does it mean I'll never go back to Santon? No, of course I will. The JSC is there. One day we'll have power hours back at the JSC in Santon. Not this year. Maybe next year, maybe not. But, you know, and if you're inviting me to a fancy lunch at one of those nice steakhouses with lots of red wine, well, then I'm there. But, but don't expect me to go to Santon for a meeting. Don't expect me to go anywhere for a meeting. We, we've broken that habit. And, and yeah, there's going to be pushback on it. Um, ditto conferences. You know, do conferences still exist? Yeah, they, of course they will. But we're going to rethink the conferences. I mean, web costs. So we did, we've, I've been doing just uh, power hours now since uh, 2011. We've always done a physical event, Durban, Cape Town, Johannesburg, and a webcast event at the same time. And truthfully, the physical event was always the core. And, and there's some niceties to it. I love this. I'm presenting it from my home. It means I have no fight with traffic. If it wasn't for COVID, we would all be in Santon right now. And I would have had to have fought traffic and get there early and set up and hope I didn't leave something back at home and et cetera. But suddenly we're realizing that this tech does work. And yes, it's different. Make no mistake. It, a webcast is different to an in-person event on, on numerous different levels. But we've understand, we've learned that those differences don't make it impossible. Some of them are challenges. Some of them are perks. I mean, for example, here, you know, anyone can raise a hand. Sometimes in a, in a live setting, someone's just too timid, too shy. You're sitting behind a large person and I can't see your hand coming up or that sort of thing. Um, so, I mean, two of the big things, meetings, over. I mean, like face-to-face -face meetings, man, you've got to have a really, really solid reason. And that should be a good steak and a great bottle of wine. Like two or three great bottles of wine. Um, and, and conferences, yeah, but they're going to have to be really special for me to to trudge out and and particularly think global conferences the ft do a series of global conferences around the world they've canned it they're doing them webcasts and it just works better and attendances are significantly high and i can vouch for that we're getting record attendances at our webcasts the technology is there now i've been doing webcasts since 2008 2009 um when i was working at the blue bank and uh you know the tech is not new the tech is now absolutely perfect so work from home will have impacts on where we live if you're working from home and you're 100% remote, you can now live anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's especially outside, you know, cities, expensive cities. Now, you know, San Francisco, I was just reading before I came on an article how, how rents have gone down uh, by double digits in San Francisco. No, double digits, 11, 12 percent. Um, partly people losing jobs, uh, but also partly being told, you know, you don't have to work from home. So why live in an expensive city? You know, so maybe... You want to be in Cape Town, but you need to live in Cape Town. Now, at the moment, you're fighting traffic, but instead you could go and live, I don't know, Stellenbosch or, or Wellington or something like that. I could be living in Durban. You know, one of my biggest reasons for saying I had to stay in Johannesburg was events, but TV. Except that I've done my TV show every week since 27th of March, but I haven't been into a studio. I've done it via Zoom technology. Is it the same as what it was? No. We're adapting, we're changing it. And that has significant implications all over the place in terms of where we live, how we live, what we're doing. I mean, we need different space requirements. You know, if you're working from home, you know, maybe that spare room now becomes an office. Maybe you need a slightly bigger place. Um, and, and But maybe the bigger place, instead of living in, in, in Houghton, Johannesburg, you can boogie off and go live you know, in Michalisburg, get a slightly bigger place. It's probably going to be cheaper and a better quality of life. 
I think storage is going to be interesting. I think we're going to start to think, hang on, and I'm going to come back to it when I talk around around leisure and the like. But I think storage is, is an issue as well, where it's a case of, okay, hang on a second. Let's get smarter about how we live in our house. Um, and, and the best examples, you know, for example, New York, where it snows uh, half the year during the snowing period, you want your snow skis, but during summer, you send them off to storage. Um, so uh, housing in cities are going to have huge implications. Transport. If I'm traveling less to work, and I have done, you know, I haven't worked in an office in, in, in a decade, so I don't travel much as it is sort of driving in my car and the like. I used to fly a lot. Um, in fact, I've probably flew a heck of a lot more than, in fact, undoubtedly. But, you know, less travel. And those implications for vehicle sales. It has implications for energy companies. Um, it also has implications for maybe Uber and car rental. Do we start seeing more one-car families? Which means when you need the second car, you Uber. And when you go, and then it comes down to, you know, I drive a, a two-seater roadster. Um, I love it. It's huge amounts of fun. And sometimes it's impractical. You know, when I want to go to Pilensburg and game viewing, you don't want to do that in a little two-seater drop top. I mean, that, that's not, so what do I do? I rent a car for a weekend. So those sort of changes are going to start coming through. And this is the impact that work from home. And we don't need 100% of the workforce to be at home for these impacts to start to happen. You can see, suddenly, do you need so much office space? Do we need so much uh, uh, living space, apartments in the major centers, Joburg, uh, uh, Cape Town, New York, San Francisco, London, et cetera. So the list goes on. Um, people can move out into the suburbs. They can move out into, into the villages. We can go live in different countries. You know, your challenge ultimately becomes you know, time zones more than anything else. And then that free time. And what do we do with that free time that we're saving from the not traveling? You know, if you're in a major city, your, your commute is quite possibly an hour or two a day um, that you're spending in that commute. And you've probably, you know, you've you listened to podcasts. Certainly when the lockdown, hard lockdown started, we saw po podcast listenership initially spike and then drop off as people weren't commuting. But what do you do with that extra time? Um, you know, chasing experiences instead. Now the challenge is, you know, don't work. Don't, don't now give your boss 14 hours a day. That's not the answer. Suddenly we've got that extra time. We, we can now start to do things. That's why I, I referenced storage. Hobbies, I think, is going to be one of the things. And I know hobbies is the weirdest word, but perhaps we're actually going to start having time for, for hobbies. Because at the moment, certainly, yeah, I already work from, from home, but my life was just a, a, a sort of a, a mill of one after the other and, and cluttered with meetings. My lockdown life is busier. I'm getting more done, but I'm also getting a whole lot more free time in the process. Office space, of course simply less required and to rethink the office space as well and i'm thinking of a post-covid world so i'm not thinking around social distancing and the like i'm thinking about companies you know whether it just be a little 20 or 30 maybe a 50 staff or maybe tens of thousands of of of, of staff offices are suddenly going to become like yeah you might still have them but you certainly don't need as much space massive implications for property generally uh corporate uh, you know, office space etc as well as residential Retail, look, online is the big winner. Make no mistake about this. South Africa off a very low base. About 1% of our retail sales on every year were online. Um, I've heard numbers out there that in, by May we were starting to hit sort of 4, 5, 6% um, and perhaps growing. Uh, lots of potential here locally. Bad news for shopping malls. We already have an oversupply of shopping malls, but I'm, I'm buying... I bought jeans online the other day. I mean, I could have gone to the shop, but I don't want to put myself in. I know exactly the jeans I want. Basically, I'm wearing a pair, and I just want two more like this pair. So I find the supplier, I check the size on the jeans, and I buy two pairs, and they get shipped to me. We, 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 yeah, the, 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 online the, the online shopping experience has got a lot to improve, particularly with some of the South African experiences. I've had some fairly uh, less than, than great ones, but there's a lot of scope in that space, and that's really bad for shopping malls. We take it a step further, you know, we see small mom and pops going out of business. Who's going to replace them? I also think that the big retailers are going to start relooking. You know, traditional large retailer, they will adapt. They've got the, the technology, they've got the cash, they've got the, you know, they, they can adapt. But I think even they're going to be looking more online. You know, uh, Woolies online, Pick and Pay online, uh, the Checkers uh, 6060 app, um, suddenly just, you know, exploding. Uh, 6060 only arrived in my area on, 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 on Monday. Um, I haven't been able to use it because every time I log on, it's like, oh, nope, sorry, we fall, come back tomorrow type of scenario. Um, whereas when it initially launched in Bryanston, I know people who lived in Bryanston, uh, they could log on whenever they liked. 
you know, uh, Microsoft has said they saw two years of, of, of acceleration basically happen in April. And, and, and the same in online. I think the online, the, the large traditionals can adapt very well to the online space. And I think the implication of that is in store, we'll see smaller ranges. We'll see smaller stores and perhaps smaller store footprints, number of stores as well. Now, how many willies, pick and pays, discams, et cetera, do you need if I can actually just sit in my house and go click, 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 order and, and, and have it delivered? So retail is going to be a big win. And I think traditional large retail will, will broadly manage through it. It's going to be tough as they change. They'll change it. Mom and pop stores, they're going to absolutely struggle. Um, many of them have closed because they just don't have the, the, the access to, 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 to bridging finance. They don't have the access to, to you know, the holding them over the period of zero income. They can move online, but I think they need to be niche and they need to be effective. How do you beat Willys? Well, you sell something that Willys doesn't have and hope they don't copy it. Or you sell something which Woolies does have or in the, in the space of Woolies, but you do it better. You make it more niche. You make it, I'm going to talk a lot about hyper-local. You make it more hyper-local. You personalize the experience. Something which a big corporate such as Woolies is really, really going to struggle with, with, with doing. Uh, Kevin, with the drop in shopping more usage and the huge drop in SA property ETFs, are they going to recover, sell, take loss? Uh, so I've got some property ETFs, uh, South Africa and global. I haven't sold, I haven't bought more. It's going to be a long, hard road back for them. At the end of the day, the quality ones will get rid of their sort of B and C grade malls and, 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 and I don't know who they're going to get rid of them to. What do we use them for? Schools maybe? That was an idea Keith McLachlan threw out this morning when I was chatting with him. Um, you know, what do we do with them? Ultimately, they're going to recover, but it's going to be a long road back. Make absolutely no mistake about that. So but here's the thing, and I talk about experiences. <clears throat> Hard local, we didn't find joy in the things even as we sur were surrounded by them. We missed the experiences, beaches, bars, bowling, biking, barbers, and I'm only touching on the bees there and not even all of the bees. Our lives, and, and I speak broadly, the royal we, our lives pre-lockdown were, were this mad scramble f to own things and to have things and to, to present ourselves in a certain way. And it's the cliches, keeping up with the Joneses or the Englovals, the fancy cars and houses and everything else. And when we were locked down, what did we miss? We, 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 we missed the stuff that in some cases was really cheap, just the, you know, going and having a beer with a friend in a bar, going to a beach and being warm, uh, getting a haircut. You know, it, it, so my haircuts are sorted. I bought some clippers. My wife is going to be a brilliant haircutter by the end of the year. Um, so far, she's doing styling. You know, just going for a bike ride, bowling, whatever it might be. Um, those are what we missed. We missed the experiences. And there's been a move already to experience over owning. We've seen it from the millennials. We've seen it from the Generation Zs. Experience has been gaining ground versus the having things. Forget having things. Forget, you know, and it comes, I think, the reason the millennials and the Generation Zs is they saw their parents, the boomers, uh, predominantly the boomers, but who worked immensely hard and did incredibly well. You know, they really did. And, and, and they came out, their parents were out of the war, the Second World War. Um, and the boomers of the, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the, 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 even back into the 60s, they really, really did well. But they worked immensely hard. And at the end of it, they had things to show for their hard work but they lacked experiences. They hadn't done stuff. Yes, they'd been on a holiday to Greece or you know, Disneyland or something like that, but it was more about sort of, you know, hey, here's what I've got and I can show you what I, as opposed to what you've done. And this, I think it, it, the pandemic has absolutely changed that to where experiences become way more important than owning. <clears throat> Lockdown, pandemic made the things we own less attractive and made us realize what we do miss and what does matter. And this is going to have massive implications in, in, in how we are going to manage. Leisure and entertainment is going to be more about the shared and the lived experience um, than it is going to be, you know, about, ah, uh, I went to, 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 I don't know, Ibiza or whatever the case is. Eating out. We're going to see a lot less restaurants because a whole bunch just aren't going to survive. And I think there's going to be, you know, structural unemployment. But the restaurant is going to be better and they're going to rethink their experience. They're going to rethink their menu because part of that restaurant experience is going to be Uber. Uber Eats. You know, I can order Uber Eats from some of my favorite restaurants, but their, their, their menu was constructed and I don't, I'm not dissing them for it. Of course it was. Their menu was constructed for a sit down experience, not to be put into a container into the back of a motorbike and driven 10 or 15 minutes to my house. 
I think menus are going to get rethought. I think dark kitchens, where you don't even have a sit-down space. Um, you know, uh, uh, I can't remember the restaurant in, in, in uh, uh, Rosebank, uh, Marble. You know, he's just said, I'm not opening. He says, I'm not reopening my restaurant under current regulation because the restaurant is a, is a complete experience and I can't do that complete experience. So we're not even going to try. So restaurants and eating out is going to be fundamentally different. Online is going to start facilitating, but I think it's going to start moving into the background, much as it does with an Uber Eats or an Uber. Online is still critically important, but it's going to shift into the background. And I think luxury becomes so early 2000s, that swanky, expensive watch on your arm that you bought from an overpriced Richemont store. It's back to experience. Experience, I think, is going to be work from home and experience are going to be two of the biggies. And that then brings us to leisure. Uh, CEO and founder of Airbnb is on, on record as saying travel may never be the same again. In the immediate, of course it isn't, but even longer term. He's talking about holidays closer to home, drive to destinations versus flying, in-country versus, versus foreign destinations, um, less congested holidays, game parks over resorts, standalone accommodation over holidays. Now this is in part an immediate response to COVID. But again, it's, it's longer term. If, 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 if it's more about experience, isn't it more important that our family's there? In which case, sure, some can take an entire family to Disney World. But for a lot of folks, it's like, look, we can't go to Disney World, but we can get a really, really great place for an extended family out in Michalisburg or down in Clarence or Durban or, or Wellington or, or whatever the case may be. And I think if we take that, it's going to be more about experience versus owning. I think those experiences come into the leisure industry at the same time. And if we have more leisure time, we need to spread our budget a little bit further at the same time. And it becomes, you know, it's no longer just a case of, well, I get two weeks leave, let me go to Disneyland for two weeks. And I don't know why I'm picking on Disneyland, but nonetheless, you know, let me go to Disneyland for two weeks. It's about, well, hang on a second, I don't want just two weeks. I want 10 weeks of, of, of leave a year. Yeah, I, I've been, since I left uh, working for a corporate, I, I, I take a week's holiday four times a year. In fact, that's not true. I take a week's holiday three times a year and I take a month over Christmas. So I run it seven weeks holiday a year. Um, and, and I think we're going to start seeing that move to that. But then your budget has to st stretch further. Hence, more local, more in-country, uh, less crowded. Um, and then hyperlocal. Uh, Manuel Castells, my wife introduced me to him in the late 90s. He wrote a number of books, the Information Age Trilogy. So what I'm talking about, 96, 7, and 8, a book a year over three years. And he talked around how the internet removed time and geography. My words, not his. Um, and the biggest, ex biggest example of that for me was in the 80s as a kid, I used to play correspondence chess. So you would literally write a postcard and send it to someone. The problem was postcards and letters, th th there was a cost associated. So I didn't do much of it. And then, you know, I played at school in like, and in the 90s, I, I stopped playing chess. I just, you know, it, it's, you know, where do you find the time? Where do you find someone to play against? And then a website popped up, which I play chess on, and it's not the one on the screen now, but I play online chess. I'm, you know, I, I can be playing 200 games of chess at a time, but three weeks to make my move. It removed, the fact that I could do it online removed time and geography. It didn't matter that I'm playing with someone in Russia or someone in America or in some cases, you know, someone just in Santon. The time and the geography was removed. I logged on when I had some spare time. I made my moves. The next person, when it was, you know, they then logged on. They saw that they had some moves. They made their moves. Suddenly everyone, the internet made everyone our neighbor because it, it, it totally removed that time and geography. And then what started to happen was the internet started to bring local back again because although everyone was my neighbor, I didn't know them. The person I'm playing chess with, I know them as an avatar. I know them as a, as, as, a, as a handle, a name on the internet. I don't know who they are. There might be a slight bio. Sometimes you'll chat in a chat group. I'm not a very chatty chess player. So they're my neighbor, but I don't know who they are. And Uber Eats and Uber kind of brought that local back to a degree and said, actually, you know, your neighbor is your neighbor, but they're anonymous. We still don't know our driver in an Uber. Um, we have a great driver. We don't know how to get them again. Uh, smartphones connects local to each other. But what I think we're going to start getting is absolutely hyper-local, where, yes, the internet broke time and geography. And as I said, it facilitates, but it's going to start perhaps shifting into the black background. You know, the fact that we're sitting on amazing technology we couldn't have dreamed of 40 years ago to do this webcast is, you know, in the background. That, that, no, no one's thinking about the, the wowness of the fact of 200 people sitting in 200 different parts of the country all listening to me present from, from my, my living space. I mean, and that, that, that local, that supporting the community, we can use online tools, we can, and why do we start to move to hyper-local? 
because of the experience. You know, I buy my bread from a Vovotella partly because they make the best bread. I really, really like it. Um, it it's, it's an affordable bread, but it's also the supporting of my community. You know, I will buy butter from my deli. It's not as, as cheap as the butter from, from, from uh, a pick and pay or, or something, but it's, it's supporting him. And we'll use the online tools, but I think it's going to become a lot more of that hyper-local facilitated by the internet. And I give you an example of Uber Eats. I don't know that Uber Eats survives because they're taking 30% from a restaurant and that's a big slice. The problem is, is that when lockdown happened, the restaurants didn't know how to communicate with us. You know, your favorite restaurant or bar or whatever the case is, when you walked in, the staff knew who you were, but how did they know how to contact you? Did they have your name? Did they have your, your mobile number? In some cases, yes, but in many not. I think we're going to start seeing that. I think we're going to start seeing, seeing restaurants, bars, and other, you know, across, you know, hairdressers, everyone suddenly saying, hang on a second, I need to have a direct relationship with the individual who's coming into my establishment, or, or maybe who I'm delivering that dinner to or something like that. Hence the move towards hyperlocal. And then borders. Borders are going to become harder. Um, and I mean hard in that, harder to get through, especially if unemployment remains elevated. I think that's likely. I'm going to touch on that. Immigration is going to be hard, even for skilled workers. Um, countries are going, to, are going to sink into themselves, into nationalism in, in a sense. Uh, food security. You know, both in what a country grows and trades. For example, uh, South Africa's you know, massive wheat and maize uh, uh, producer. Um, and then you know, when Zimbabwe has a drought or something, uh, their crop failure, we sell to them. That pushes the price up in South Africa because it pushes up demand. Now, sometimes we have record crops and then we've got excess, but suddenly it's going to be a case of countries are going to look at, hang on a second, food security. First, let's make sure we have got enough. And then we can start to look beyond that. Pharma security in terms of drugs. You know, so when the pandemic broke out and it turned out the U.S. don't manufacture N95 masks. Yes, it's owned by 3M. Yes, 3M have the patent. Yes, 3M is an American company. They don't produce them in America. You know, and, and, and the concern was, well, tell, the, tell your factory wherever to ship them to us. There were reports during April of, of shipments of masks and the like just frankly being sort of hijacked at airports and not hijacked by gangs of, 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 of thugs, hijacked by governments and health departments and the like. Um, yeah, the, the reports out this morning about U.S. wants to buy three months global supply of remdesivir, and I've pronounced that badly too. Um, yeah, they're trying to secure their stockpile. Remember when the drug came out that Aspen has that is can be used and it can help with, with, with uh, critically ill COVID-19 patients. The first statement from our government was, you know, woohoo, we have 300,000 or was it 30,000 units in country and we can produce another 300,000 by the end of the year. This wasn't about how great are we and hello world come by from us. Just this, the story out of our health department, uh, uh, Dr. Zwillian Kesey, was all about what do we have in country and what can we build in country. Borders are going to become hard. And that's partly why I now say travel is going to start to become local rather than distant. It's going to be harder to get through the borders. Supply chains, they're going to become more simplified. Just in time, crashed during lockdown and in part still struggling. And I've used the example of the iPhone before. You know, 30 components from 15 different countries from 30 different factories. The problem's quite simple. If you've got 29 of those components, but the 30th factory stood in lockdown because of a positive COVID-19 case, now what? You can't make that iPhone. So I think that move is also going to be to local supply chains Con, 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 contracting inwards. That's going to increase cost. You know, why is an iPhone made in, in, in Foxconn in China? Well, because they can do it cheap and best. Um, and if, if, if iPhones were made, for example, in America, it would cost more money. And I think we're going to start to say, well, okay, you know, that, and this comes back to my hyperlocal. So, yeah, it's going to increase costs, but also increase employment. You know, if your iPhone's been made in America instead of Foxconn, it means there's jobs in America. Um, if we're making our masks locally instead of importing, if we're you know, growing our food, it's going to make it more local. Tech goods are harder, but it's not impossible. Some tech. Yeah, you know, I mean, truthfully, anything can be made anywhere. But <clears throat> tech needs to really happen on a scale. A lot of things need to happen on a scale. But with supply chains contracting, um, particularly in a hyperlocal world, especially in a world where borders are, are becoming harder, what we're going to start to see, I suspect, very much is that contracting of the supply chain. It will push costs, will improve employment, and it will help communities. So then to employment. 
I mean, surely a long road back to pre-pandemic levels. I mean, some businesses are just gone for good. Some businesses are operating with less. You know, they had to retrench or fire a couple of staff and they realized, well, we can still do this. This isn't so bad. And of course, technology reducing need for as much staffing. You know, when I do an event like this and I do it physically at a venue, that requires a team of people. Now, there needs to be sound people. There needs to be a whole bunch of people. And it depends on the venue I'm using, but some of the venues, there are three or four people, five or six, who are involved in the process of the event. Suddenly you use technology and it's, it's me. It's me here with the light and a video, you know, a laptop and, and we're off to the races. Um, and we saw ADP number out of the US today. It was a miss. It was about 2.4 million. The market expected 3 million jobs created. Uh, but it still suggests that the unemployment in the US is probably at about 13%. Um, peaked at what, 16 and change. But I think there's going to be structural unemployment, much as we've had in South Africa. But I think, you know, are we going to get back to Unemployment in the US at sub 5%. I don't I, I think it's going to be years and years and years and years and years for that to happen. Um, and that then, you know, low levels of spending. And we're going to see staff staffing easily cut, you know, technology replaces. We're going to see side hustles become more important to the individuals. And that goes back again to my hyperlocal. And that side hustle might be because your hours are cut, maybe your job is cut, maybe you were a two income family and now you are one or one and a half income family. Um, I know some people are saying, well, hang on a second, you know, we're now a one and a half income family instead of a, a double income family uh, and the kids are at home, why don't we homeschool instead of, you know, do, 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 do the traditional schooling thing and start getting clever like that. So side hustles, you know, one dealer, Keith McLaughlin and I want about 20 cases of a good wine, stick it in his garage and over the next three years we'll drink it and the rest will sell it to two or three times uh, uh, the cost. And I've done this before. And the, the, the point is, is that you basically sell it to restaurants. They don't have the storage, they don't have the cash flow. We can use those two to our advantage. Drive-ins in your garden, your local park. Uh, if, if, if a friend of my colleague, Christia, she's doing a drive-in in her garden, she's doing a tester. So, you know, got some simple kit, audio through the, um, through the, 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 the radio in the car, um, take 15 cars, you could use a local park, schools could do it. Now, post-COVID, we can go back to the, to the movies and to a degree we will, but it comes back to experiences. The driving is fun, it's entertaining, we can take our own food, we can you know, drink some wine or some beer or something. Although, as someone said to me today, can I Uber there because I want to Uber home so I can drink? There's a chap I follow on, on, on Facebook who, beginning of lockdown, started you know, how to make sourdough yeast, and, it, and now he's selling sourdough bread. Is he going to retire and become a sourdough dough, uh, uh, baker? Probably not, but he's selling at 50 bucks a pop. He's on par with the Woolies price, but it's fresh, it's local, um, and uh, it's a side hustle for him, and it can make him some cash there. So I think we're going to start seeing a lot of that starting to happen in terms of side hustles picking up. And a part of the point of side hustles is their hobbies. So my hobby is drinking red wine. So the idea of buying 20 cases, of course, that makes perfect sense. Um, you know, if, if, if baking was your, your, your hobby, well, now your hobby becomes your side hustle, becomes your hyper-local, and it all starts to click together. <coughs> Excuse me. So some winners and losers, and they're going to be a lot. The hyper-local, I think, is going to be a big winner. Shoppings, holidays, experiences, family, the ability to live rural, um, a, a sense of and I didn't see it, i got to be honest, as much as I thought I would. But suddenly a sense of, hang on a second, you know, almost a care for your neighbors, which perhaps didn't exist as much pre-lockdown. And part of that care might, frankly, have been totally altruistic and that you were worried, did they have COVID and could they spare you a bottle of wine? Um, but it's it certainly, you know, it's starting to happen, starting to see that happen. Our shopping is going to be hugely different in terms of, what we buy, in terms of what matters to us, in terms of how we shop online versus uh, uh, large retail stores and the like. Online is the obvious one. I said right up front that third slide of this presentation, imagine this pandemic, this lockdown without the internet, um, both in terms of shopping, both in terms of, of working. Uh, online is going to be absolutely humongous. And that's partly the tech giants. So that is the tech giants such as, for example, the Microsofts and the Zooms and the Amazons. Um, the NAS pass and their and their ten cent. Um, so certainly it's going to be that. But it, it's it, it it more than 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 that. It's what it facilitates, and that's what I spoke about a moment ago. You know what Uber did 
was just facilitate, and particularly Uber Eats. I mean, we had missed a delivery in South Africa. We've had it for, for ages. It was never a great experience. It always seemed to be overly expensive and take too long, and they nickeled and dimed you and stuff. Um, and now it's just become absolutely seamless. And Mr. Delivery's got an app that's on par with, 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 with Uber. But if I think back 20 years to when I lived in Borges Hill, when I got my pizza delivered, I phoned the pizza hut down literally at the bottom of the hill, uh, spoke to the husband or the wife who owned and ran the place, and, well, you know, and he would drive up the hill and knock on my door and, and, and deliver my pizza to me. And when I first moved to Joburg, same scenario, there was a little place around the corner. And I think and that's a, it's a huge challenge for the, for the businesses, but it's a challenge that if they can get it right, it becomes more personal and it becomes more hyper-local. Family, friends, free time, I think that's going to be, if we, if we do this right, I think this becomes a, 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 a big winner from it. It comes back to, you know, what did we miss in lockdown? We, we missed a beer with our, with our friends. We, we missed a lunch with our family on, on, on a Sunday, um, that sort of thing. And yes, we could Zoom. My, my, my sister and her kids are in Durban. So my wife, myself, my sister and her two kids, we do Friday lockdown dinners. And we've done one every Friday evening since the 27th of March. Now, truthfully, as a result of that, we spend more time interacting during lockdown as a group than we have normally, because you know, how often do one of us get to the other one city, et cetera, et cetera. But equally truthfully, it's not the same. I mean, you know, it's, it's just not the same. It, it's, it's great. And yes, you chat to people more often, but it's not, it's not, not exactly 100% what we're looking for. And that's why I think that personal is going to take a big one. Leisure, smaller, local, more experiential. The experiential is going to be huge. We're going to see significant winners there. We're going to see significant losers there. Um, you know, your big resorts, et cetera, yes, but I think they're going to find it uh, tougher to go through. I think international destinations, yes, but I think a lot more local, a lot more holidaying in country. I, I'm a, I, you know, I've, for, for a decade, I, I, I'm trying to think when last I did a, a, an overseas holiday. My logic's quite certain. You know, if I've got a week or 10 days, for me to go to Europe or the US or Asia or, or wherever for a holiday, it's, you know, it's two to three days of travel time, which eats into my holiday. The travel time's terrible and horrible. It can be expensive. It's, and you know, it's just so much easier to whiz down to you know, many parts of, of, of Southern Africa. Maybe it's Namibia, maybe it's Durban, maybe it's Isimangiso up in the north coast of KZN, whatever it might be. Uh, depending how you like your holidays, we've got it in country. Social justice, this has become interesting. And I'm not here talking as much. I mean, Black Lives Matter has obviously come up and, and been all over the press. But I'm talking more than just uh, uh, that. I'm talking around you know, the whole concept of, of, of understanding that how we, how we look at people and how we you know, perceive value. And, and, and the key point is people who've been having to look, you know, you've, you've got two people who work in a company. One of them is having to look after their kids at the same time and the other isn't. And that's fundamentally different. And I think we've started to become perhaps a little more aware aware and acute to that and the fact that we do care about our communities. Now, I will pay for the slightly more expensive butter from the local deli because you know, I like the guy who owns the deli and that then goes to help his kids go to school, which keeps them off the streets on a Friday evening, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it's good for my broader community space. Losers, they're going to be losers. They're always going to be losers. Office blocks and shopping malls. They're not hyper-local, there's an oversupply, and there's simply going to be less demand for them. You know, the, the going to Santon, whether it's Santon City or the offices there, whether it be head offices or shared offices, etc., starts to become a question of, yes, but why? I mean, to, to, to what point? As I said, you want me to meet in Santon, you bring steak and lots of red wine, and then I will consider it. Um, but property is going to be fundamentally changed. Office parks and shopping malls, fundamentally different. The flip side is we might see an uptick in industrial demand for property, particularly with borders, with manufacturing, some of that coming back in country, that then. Airlines and hotels. So, I mean, sometimes the hotels, you know, the, the, the right experience, what you're looking for. Um, airlines, but short haul rather than long haul. Particularly if we start to see uh, supply chains start to, 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 to contract, we start to see more hyper-local happen, then we need to bring less goods in from Asia, from Europe, from North America. So maybe it's not even just necessarily airlines in terms of me and you sitting on an airplane, but the goods and the storage in the, in the container hold as well. Transportation, less driving to work, less shorter supply chains, uh, less demand for energy uh, in that space. You know, one of the Bollow World results yesterday, Hilton Tarrant tweeted about it. 
they're uh, they basically they're going to be going they their own budget in Avis and they're cutting back from uh, what was 150 uh, branches uh, they've now cut it to around 90 and they're going to cut it down to around 60. They're getting rid of cars. They're going to cut their number of cars by more than half. They're cutting their staffing by half. Um, and, and this has been a trend already. I used to, I travel a lot. And every time I landed in a new city, first thing, Avis, get my car. Thank you very much. And then it started being, hang on, get my Uber. Now, truthfully, sometimes it was actually cheaper to rent an Avis car for 300 Rand for the day than do my Uber trips, which end up costing five or 600. But it also comes down to convenience. You know, whilst I'm in an Uber, I can do something. When I'm driving, I'm driving. That's what my focus is. Um, transportation is going to be fundamentally changed. Uh, as I said, a statement assets such as luxury goods and the like, if we're moving to an experiential society, that, if anything, gets frowned upon. And cities, cities are not going to disappear. Cities are not going to die. Uh, but cities might start finding it tougher. And I, I use, again, the San Francisco example, San Francisco example I mentioned earlier, where rentals are down. Um, that means the rentals are down because there's less tenants, because tenants have either moved out because they've lost jobs, or they moved out because they can work remote. But that then has implications for cities in terms of their revenue. So you know, cities are going to, to struggle. Now, cities have benefits. I, I love living in Joburg. I mean, I want to get back to Durban, but I know that I will miss Joburg. And I, I've lived here now 13 years and, and still love, the, love the, the, the vibe of a city. I love the range of a city. I love what I can get from a city. Um, but you know, they're, they're expensive and they're, they're dirty and there's all sorts of drawbacks to them and they've got more crime and all of that sort of thing. And if we working remote, how important do cities become? They're still going to be there, but they're going to certainly come under pressure. And then, of course, one of the winners, and I mentioned it uh, on the previous slide, I'm not going to go back, winners could be rural areas. There's little rural towns where everyone sucked out and went to the city. Suddenly, we might start seeing people come back into those rural areas. So the three biggies, as I link them together, it's remote work, it's hyperlocal, and it's experience. And we're going to see those three, I think, play out. And they, 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 they feed into each other in two degrees. If we were remote working, we could go live in Smithsdale rather than have to live close to Santon or, or, or Cape Town City, you said to, or wherever it is, our, our offices. So suddenly then that hyperlocal becomes even more important. And then experiences become that much more critical. So I think the, the, the big moves is going to be that remote work, the hyperlocal, and experiences are going to be the big drivers. And... You know, I've prophesied, I've thrown out ideas of exactly how. Truthfully, in 10 years' time, when I look at it, it might be fundamentally different. But this is how I expect broadly what those trends are. The end date we'll find out in time. And there's going to be a pushback because change is scary. Uncertainty is scary, albeit certainty is a myth. If 2020 has taught us anything, certainty is a lift. But as individuals, we want our old lives back, but we can have better ones. Corporates want their old profits back, but they can have better profits and better profits. Uh, products. Don't, you know, the, the fear of change is real, but you know, change which has been forced on us, um, and we would frankly rather it wasn't. I mean, no one's saying, well, pandemic, we can have some great outcomes. No, 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 no one's saying that. But we find ourselves in this space, and it's a case of we've been handed an opportunity. And what that then plays to is, what's the future that we want? And that's, you know, how do we manage the pushback? We manage the pushback by saying, well, how, would we, how would we prefer our life to be? Now, so the first thing we want is, uh, please, no pandemic. Let's get rid of the COVID-19. Um, but dream it and do it. And what I mean is zoom out. So what would you like your life and your broader community and family's life and your work environment and your relationships, what would you like them to look like in five or ten years? And, and dream big. There are no constraints. Don't say, well, I'd like to live here, but I can't because my job is here. No, no. Pretend this is a blank canvas. You can do anything that you want. What do you want your life to look like in five or ten years? Um, how would you like it to happen? And, and what's important, <clears throat> excuse me, now I've spoken about this often, which is if you're not driving that change, in five or ten years, your life is exactly as it is now, except maybe you hate it even more. So zoom out to five or 10 years and then zoom back to now and say, what change can I make today that helps me on that road to five or 10 years time? And it might be, so for example, I said, you know, your problem is you want to live in a rural area, but you need to do whatever and your job is in Johannesburg. 
Okay, so how do you change that? Well, you speak to your boss, or maybe you reschool yourself and get a new skill set. Maybe you become a, a meister baker and, and you move to a rural area and become the baker or the butcher or the candlestick maker or whatever the case may be. You know, don't limit yourself by, by what we can think. Decide, this is what I would like to see. How do, I, how do I get down that journey? And it's not going to be linear and it's not going to be smooth. But what we have, and it's what I said right up front, that I want to say almost for the first time ever, we have an epoch moment which gives us opportunity like never before. You know, even scenarios such as dot com crash, uh, 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 you know, World War Two, World War One, the pandemic of nineteen eighteen. I mean, nine you know, eleven. There's been some giant moments, and nine eleven was undoubtedly an epoch moment, but it didn't impact everyone directly, never mind indirectly. I mean, a lot of people you know, here, here in South Africa, were we impacted? Yeah, we were, but very, very sort of at the peripherals of the process. If you were living in New York directly, if you were living in America very directly, this is something which has touched everyone and in largely the same way, which is something which I don't know when something like this has happened before. I was digging around the worst year ever, and it turns out to be uh, the year, I think it's 536. Uh, there was two volcanoes, which meant that the sun didn't shine, so temperatures dropped, crops failed, and then a pandemic came, and somewhere between 30 and 50% of the planet died. Um, you know, and and you know, that, that, that's the extreme. We're not at that point, but we, we are at a point now where of the 8 billion people on planet Earth, most of us have been touched by this pandemic very, very directly. Um, and that means that our acceptance, adherence to the idea around change is suddenly like, well, a whole lot really. Because what's the one way to manage change? Yeah, the classic cliche, someone who's, you know, completely out of weight and, 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 and sorry, uh, out of shape and, and, and bad health has a heart attack and suddenly it's like, whoop, next thing you know, they're doing Ironmans and running the comrades and riding, you know, cycling the Argus and, you know, paddling the, the doozy um, because of that single event. Except this time it wasn't one person, it's planet Earth. So that returning to the new normal, we need to fight, we need to know what we want. In closing, a couple of points. This is our epoch moment. And that epoch moment, and if you Google the definition, the epoch means this a point in time which will be referenced back to. For, for, for 100 years, maybe more, people, yeah, I just, I, in the previous slide, I talked about, I said, oh, World War, World War II, World War I. In fact, when you say the war, you know, you might, which one is it? Well, it's probably two, maybe it's World War I. Yeah, this is our epoch moment. It's been hard and it's not yet over and the change will continue to be hard, but it is an epoch moment. And how terrible if in 10, 20, 30 years time, we look back at our epoch moment as a society and we're like, yeah, nothing changed. Yeah, there were some, I'm not saying that everything pre-COVID was bad, not at all. Lots before COVID, the tech I'm using here was good, but let's find those bits that were bad and let's get rid of them and let's find the bits that we would prefer and let's bring them in. Work, leisure, entertainment going to be the biggest changes. Uh, the productivity J, J curve changes will be slow. They've been fast at the moment, you know, in the immediate. Zoom, suddenly everyone had to know what a Zoom was. Everyone had to know how to work Microsoft Teams and all of those sort of things. There was an immediate. Um, but already you can see you know, that, that change is incremental. And yes, corporates have, the big corporates have like, whoa, this work from home uh, actually does work. And some of them have like, haven't yet sent their teams back to the office. They can, but they're saying, no, no let's, let's not. There's still a spiking pandemic in South Africa. Let's, let's keep it simple right now. Um, but the actual processes that they're going to want to put in place and the measurables and all of that, that process is going to be on. Investment trends are going to be slow, but truthfully, they're going to be easy to spot. You know, plus tech enabled remote is going to be good. Listed property, no. Local, yes. Transport, no. Small leisure, yes. Large leisure, no. We're going to see those trends. We're going to see the companies in the sectors that are struggling. You know, old school energy, big trouble. You know, uh, hydrocarbons, new school renewable energy is definitely going to be a, a significant trend going forward. And we're going to, th those trends are going to come slowly and over the months and years ahead as, as results come and as companies come out and as companies go bust and, 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 and disappear and, and new ones come out of the ashes, those trends are going to become very clear. The, the easy ones, the very, very easy ones is big tech is obviously winners. Um, I think hyper local, although that's going to be on a more personal level, I think small leisure. I think the big losers is going to be property, it's going to be transport, and it's going to be large leisure. That is going to happen slower. It's all going to happen. So the big tech was was the winner in it, like you know, almost immediately. But it's certainly going to play out. And you know, 
I'll say it again, it's, it's, it's kind of like we've been handed an opportunity and let's not, let's not pass up on it. And, and let's also be clear that my idea of the future might not necessarily be yours. And that's fine. You know, I've done the presentation. I'm the fortunate one. The camera's pointed at me. I got to put the slides together. So I get to design this around my thought pattern. And there might have been points or slides where you fundamentally disagreed. There might have been things like you're charting at your screen saying, but Simon, you don't mention this. That's cool. This is not about, you know, it's this way or the highway. It's about sort of merging it together and finding it all. Ladies and gents, I see some questions coming through. I'll jump to those in a moment. Uh, contact details for myself. All the Think Market presentations are on the Just One Lap uh, website. And of course, Think Market details there. Uh, two more events next week. Uh, I'm doing shorting and hedging using derivatives, understanding longs and shorts. And the week after, we're doing managing risk for trading 101. If, you're, if, if, if you are already trading, if you're thinking about starting trading, if you have started trading, if you think you might ever start trading, Managing risk is your most important component of the entire thing. Let me take some questions. Off the shopping mall, in my experience, most folks are there for the experience. Uh, people trapped in tiny townhouses need somewhere to go. Malls just need to make sure they enhance the experience. Arthur, that's a great point. That's an absolutely great point. And maybe it is, you know, so maybe, so let's run a thought experiment here. Those mom and pop shores and some of the shops closing down, et cetera, open space. Maybe the shopping malls need to get cleverer with their space and how they use it. And maybe it's not all shops. Maybe it is partly experiences and something. Of course, the other flip to it is the tiny townhouses. Maybe if I could live in Michalisburg instead of having to live in Johannesburg, and then I can get a big house because the townhouses are expensive. But you make a great point in terms of maybe it's shopping malls need to reimagine what they offer the, the shopper to, to attract us. And, and they've got things. I mean, absolutely they have. And one of them is movies and you know, restaurants and stuff like that. Uh, you know, my, my pick and pays and willies, yeah, I couldn't be bothered. I can do that online. But some of it does stick. And, and it's about that reimagining the future. Um, great point, Arthur. Uh, Adam, a few stocks and sectors included in the winners. So, I mean, the easy one, I mean, the, the, the very easy one, uh, particularly in the tech space, is tech rich. Now, a lot of people go for NASDAQ. I truthfully prefer the, what's called the S&P tech uh, index, which is the 78 stocks in there. But your big heavyweights, and they're only just starting, your Microsofts, your, your Amazons. Um, in, in South Africa, we, we don't have as much, although uh, Bytes UK is going to be listing out of Ultron um, in, the next, in the weeks and months ahead. And Bytes UK perfectly plays into this because what is a big part of remote uh, tech? It's things such as security. Um, you know, you've got your staff at home, you need to make sure their networks are secure. You need cloud. Bytes plays into that. I interviewed uh, Ernest Kaplan on Tuesday morning. If you go to MoneyWeb and find my MoneyWeb Now podcast, you get the interview with that. Um, so, you know, that's obviously going to be a huge winner. I'm interested in some of the, the property stocks locally, uh, sorry, uh, sort of hotel and gaming and the like. City Lodge have got some issues with their uh, um, uh, a BEE deal, and they're doing a rights issue for that. But as Sun International, I, I, you know, the resorts thing is tricky, but I think this might be something there uh, going down the line. Um, Karen, possibly even more CBD degrad degradation. Yes, unless, of course, uh, city planners are clever and smart, but I mean, there certainly is risk in that space. Shane, uncertainty in whether witnessing V or W, U or L, how much firepower. Uh, how much power of power cash do you keep at hand to invest? So I actually was chatting with uh, Christia this morning. I'm currently sitting in more cash than I usually do. I usually have a lot of cash, emergency funds, and everything else. Um, I've been buying my ETFs. I have been buying some individual stocks in the last uh, last week. Um, I bought uh, uh, Purple Group. Their deal with uh, Capitex, a big deal. And I bought uh, s uh, Storage. It's a great Royal One business in a, in a great space there. I'm... Yeah, if it's V-shaped, then we're back. But it, how do we grow above this? How do we? So we're back at where we were, more or less. S and P kind of flat for the year, top forty down two percent or so. Uh, Nasdaq at all-time highs. I can see bits of it growing, but as a broad global economy, how do we get growth back from here? So if you are V-shaped back at the top, I'm. I'm still. You know, I tweeted just before we came on. Uh, 
Bloom, uh, no, Bloomberg were reporting, I think it was Goldman Sachs, 40% of uh, America, of, 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 of uh, cities in America are either clamping down or rolling back uh, their, their openings. This, this pandemic is not over by a long way. Uh, Brandon, crystal ball time, do residential property prices drop or do we see larger houses where we can have more? So there are so many moving parts here, Brandon, but I'm quite happy to gaze into a crystal ball. What the heck? So the work from home is interesting because let's say you might still want to stay in, let's say, Johannesburg as an example. And maybe you want to stay there because you've got family here, maybe your kids are at school and you say after the kids have left school, etc. So there will be demand for houses, actually. People are going to say, well, hang on, I'm working from home. We need an extra bedroom for me to work from. Or maybe you can convert to garage or make a hut in the garden or something like that. But that could pick some demand there. But then on the flip side, there will be people who are saying, oh, heck, I'm going to go live in Michalisburg. I'm going to go live in Smithsdale, et cetera, et cetera. I think residential property, medium to long term is fine. The short term, it's going to be really, really tough because you know, buying a house requires confidence. And even if your boss is saying, yeah, you can work from home and you need an extra room, to work from, you're like, yeah, but do I still have a job come Christmas? Um, so I, I think, you know, I, I think we're going to see some in the, in the rest of this year, probably even into next year, we're going to see some significant softening in residential prices. Um, and then I think it will flatten out in return. And I think what we will see, I think the big winners are perhaps going to be the sort of non-traditionals, your Durbans, your Michalisburgs, uh, th those sort of places are probably going to uh, really good. Um, questions? Uh, Karen, will there be a turn against purchasing Chinese items to support local purchases? There will be, yes. Um, and you say this could affect investing in China ETFs? Yes, but uh, you know, China's a lot, and I do expect it to have implications on China. I worry less about China because it's a command economy. Um, I would worry probably more about, the, about some of those American and European multinationals. Uh, possible psychological effects on those people working from home reduction in people contact. Absolutely. No, make no, look, I've worked from home for 10 years. In fact, apart from four years at Standard Bank, I've worked from home. I've worked for myself from home my entire life. Well, a year it's taken a call and four years at Standard Bank. Um, and it is something which we need to be cognizant of. You know, it is too easy. And I'm not even talking under lockdown, just under normal conditions to go days, weeks without seeing people. And that's why I start, that's why I go back to the hyper local. It's why I go back to restaurants and bars. And I, I think, you know, family and that sort of thing because it's even more than just zoom it is proper good old-fashioned uh, human interaction and, and touch which is critically important uh, Shane who would I choose between Capitec, Aspen, Sasso, Naspas, Remgro uh, in a word probably your Aspen I like Capitec but I think they're probably fairly valued Sasso I don't like Naspas yep 10 cent huge Remgro I don't like holding I don't like holding structures Opinion on trading uh, traditional retailers moving to online grocery deliveries. Uh, who's at the forefront in South Africa currently? So the four, I mean, our, our big online obviously is Take a Lot. Uh, that is owned in large part by NASPAS. Um, I think in my experience so far, and anecdotal, um, I I just can't get the Woolies thing to work. Man, it asks. I can't. It doesn't have my area where I live. I try to sign up for a, a, a Willie's card, not a credit card, just a Willie's store card, you know, the one you swipe. And it told me my ID number didn't exist and their support was useless. I'm not, I mean, Willie's apparently have got dark stores, in other words, no foot traffic just for this. Anecdotal experience is ShopRite is 100 miles ahead. And that 6060 app, everyone I've, I know has used it has just said it's absolutely excellent. Uh, Herbert? Any local ETS well suited for the possible lifestyle changes we face? No, I, I listed space in terms of lifestyle. I mean, there are there are maybe companies like Long for Life, perhaps one of them. They're sort of those sort of, of, of companies. Um, our ETS locally are very focused either on offshore um, and then they fairly uh, sort of broad or geographic as opposed to, to sector specific with a few exceptions. Um, the big ones probably the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ from Satrix or the S&P Tech from uh, one invest. Uh, Brandon, your Chinese ETF opinion, horse bolted, bolted, do we look at broader Asia, India, Africa, 20-year horizon? No, China is 
China is still on the march. China will be the biggest superpower on this planet, maybe not in our lifetimes. China is still on the march. Uh, India, Africa following up behind it in time, but the next superpower economically, certainly, maybe even politically, is going to be China. Lots of time left for that. Uh, Shane, you've been doing them uh, monthly at this point. We'll see how it goes. There's a couple already on the website. If you go to that address, just one lap.com slash think markets. Uh, the first one was May, which was the data so far. The second one was June, which was the matrix and how do we get out of this and how do we invest our way out of it. Something I'd like to do quarterly, monthly, something like that. Head to the events page. You'll see some. Uh, that way for the events page, you'll see there. Ivor, uh, working from home offers more opportunity in terms of percentage of the space you can make tax deductible, bond interest rates, levies. Yeah, great point. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and you save on petrol, you know, and, and, and you also, I mean, you know, do we need two car families if, if, if everyone's working at home and that sort of thing? Um, and, and that's the thing, it's, it's the trickle downs. Now, the money you save tax deductible on bond interest rates, etc. when you sell your house, that subject, say you were claiming back 10% of your, and it's not just rates and taxes, your housekeeper, your gardening service, your security service, 10% of all of it. When you sell the house, that 10% is subject to capital gains. But you run the math, it usually works. Uh, Marsha, any opinions on weighting our investments towards countries who've been able to keep the virus under control, Japan and Australia? Marsha, that's a great point. I hadn't thought of that. Um, so there might be some benefit to it. The challenges is how. So Japan, there's an ETF. Australia, there's some, get some individual equity there. Um, and obviously, you can pick up individual equity positions in Tokyo as well. Um, but two thoughts. Does, do they get second waves? And the answer is I honestly don't know and every chance that they don't, but they might. Um, and second question is in a global environment is if, if we're seeing a global recession, they might suffer less, but they're not going to escape unharmed. But I did like that thinking. And in a uh, Chinese ETF, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm actually interviewing Helena Conradi from Satrix tomorrow. I think it's a great product to bring to market. Um, I, for me, I'm happy with global, except that my global is only about 3% China. Maybe I am missing out. Drugs rather keep local property ETF exposure lower in just one lap risk year. Yeah. So I, 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 uh, uh, I, I buy my ETFs every month, and I've, certainly I haven't been buying the property. I've been keeping that, uh, that exposure lower. The property is going to be fine at the end, but not everyone fine. Uh, Sora gave us for two days notice in India, four hours. Uh, work from home opportunity for business to externalize cost office space. Exactly. Uh, David, you're right. So, so what happens in, in that, in that in, in example? So what we're seeing with the big techs, they've given their staff a thousand rand stipend, but it's for one or thousand dollars. So one or stipend to make their home office ready in a sense, but it is cheaper for businesses. You know, suddenly they don't need a giant office in Santon. They might still have an office in Santon, but it can be a whole lot smaller. Um, it can, you know, and, and give some of the stationery and the like, the staff are going to say, kick us back some of that. But certainly this can be a cost saving for companies as well. Uh, live anywhere with a decent internet connection. David, that's my dream. I mean, all I need is a, you know, I'm on a fiber 100, 100 at the moment. I can do my TV. I can broadcast live video. Just give me a decent internet connection. We can live absolutely anywhere. Uh, but is audio quality better than a most OST webinars? Uh, so two things to that, David. One is uh, I'm using Zoom rather than go to webinar, and I think Zoom's a bit ahead of the game. And because it's only me on the line, uh, and I've also got, I'm testing out my new mic. Maybe that's the point as well. Uh, Jacques, always a pleasure. Ladies and gents, we're going to park it there. I have run my time. Uh, we have families, dinners, and everything else to go to. Uh, everyone, really appreciate your time this evening. Video will be online, let's say, tomorrow morning. Um, Kevin, absolute pleasure. Uh, everyone, stay safe, wear masks, wash your hands. Uh, this pandemic is only starting to spike in South Africa. It's going to get hectic. Chris, uh, Brandon, Jacques, everyone, uh, Shane, everyone, keep well, stay safe. Have a good evening. Cheers, all.